listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. Hello, hello, Sarah McKenzie here. I'm your host for the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. You've got episode 45. Today is a fun show. I brought on the whole Read Aloud Revival team to chat about picture books. We talk about how we use them, which ones we love best, and why we think picture books can be even more powerful than longer text, like chapter books, novels, even classics, when it comes to giving our kids what we know they all need, accurate and highly sophisticated language patterns into the ear. We chat about using picture books with older kids, And oh my goodness, don't even try to write down all the book recommendations we sling around. You will never be able to keep up. All you have to do is go to readaloudrevival.com and look for episode 45 and you'll find the show notes there. We've linked up every book and link and article we chat about on today's show. You don't want to miss them. This and every episode of the Read Aloud Revival podcast is brought to you by the Read Aloud Revival membership community, a place where parents who want to inspire a love of reading in their home gather. If you'd like to access excellent trainings, rich whole family experiences, and some of the best book recommendations on the web, you want to head to readaloudrevival.com and click on the Discover Membership button. Now, let's talk picture books. Today, I've got the whole Read Aloud Revival team with me, and we want to talk about picture books. Do you think picture books are only for your littlest kids? Well, we're going to challenge that today, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let me introduce you to the Read Aloud Revival team, just in case you haven't met them before. They're awesome. Courtney is our community director here at RAR. She's the one you hear back from when you write into the Read Aloud Revival, and she's also the one that keeps me from wandering off into the weeds and getting lost. So, you know, we can actually get this podcast to you on time. Hey, Courtney, how are you? I'm doing fine this morning. Awesome. So you can find Courtney at her blog, One Deep Drawer at CourtneyGarrison.com. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. It's a wonderful blog. And of course, you can always find her at the Read Aloud Revival forum or anywhere around the Read Aloud Revival. The other team member we have here today is Kara, who's our podcast manager. Hey, Kara, how are you? Hi, I'm good. So Kara is the one who books our awesome podcast guests and creates the questions for our interviews. She writes at Quill and Camera, which is at quillandcamera.wordpress.com. Put a link to that in the show notes as well. So that's the team, Courtney Garrison and Kira Anderson and myself. And today we're going to chat about picture books. First, before we do that, why don't you ladies tell us a little bit about your family? Courtney, do you want to start? Sure. I've got three kids, a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. And we live in the Pacific Northwest and we love picture books. What do you know? (laughs) Yes, you do. Actually, when I don't mention them enough, you start getting on my case like, hey. It's true. (laughs) (laughs) Like, what's all these chapter books? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's funny because I tend to lean toward choosing a chapter book. Even when my kids were little, I would kind of find myself leaning toward that. But yeah, you always rein me back in like, hey, you're missing a whole (laughs) lot of goodness here by skipping over those picture books. Okay, well, I Kara. think we, okay. we think of picture books as something for a little kid, something that you grab the kid who can sit on your lap and you read the picture book together. And you think maybe now that they can't sit on my lap, we're done with picture books. But yeah, like you said, hopefully we'll change your mind. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm pretty sure you'll change all of our minds here. <laughs> okay, Kara, tell us a little bit about your family. Well, I have two kids. They're nine and 12, newly nine and newly 12. And so they're a little bit older, but we still really enjoy picture books and we like to use them a lot in our homeschool to just sort of introduce new things or just to have like a cozy minute to share together too. It's yeah. Nice I love, I love finding together. what you say online about the picture books your family shares together. I think it's like just a really good example of how you can use picture books with older kids and engage everybody. So we'll get into that this morning too. I think that will be great. Well, one thing I remember is that from our very first episode of the podcast, Andrew Putua in episode one told us about the many benefits of reading aloud. But one of the main things he says that's so important about children hearing beautiful language, he says it's so important for them to have accurate and highly sophisticated language patterns coming in through their ear. Beautiful language that comes in through their ear makes a huge difference in their ability to read well, to write well, and to communicate. And he makes this beautiful case for it in episode one. So if you're listening to this and you haven't heard episode one yet, it is by far the most downloaded episode of all of the Read Aloud Revival podcasts. You should go listen to that one, but not until we're done talking today. (laughs) 
We think picture books do that like nothing else. And we're going to talk about that today because picture books are they're short and the authors of picture books have very limited amount of text to use. And so because of that, every word is so carefully selected. Uh, we recently did an author event at the Read Revival, an author access event with Anne Ersu, and she was talking about how picture book text is masterpiece because their authors have to be very masterful in their use of language and nothing is inside of a picture book that hasn't been carefully chosen and put there on purpose. So I think picture books in some ways may do that accurate and highly sophisticated language pattern stuff <laughs> a little bit better than other books. So that is exciting to me. And it, they're so accessible. So I know when I'm like overwhelmed with reading aloud with, with just life and I feel like reading aloud gets cut from my schedule because I'm too overwhelmed. I have too many other things going on. Picking up a picture book and sitting down to read it feels a lot like a quicker, there's su such a lower barrier to entry than picking up a whole chapter book and feeling like this is a commitment. I have to read this thing all the way to the end. So Kara, tell me about what p using picture books looks like for you in your home. Because your kids are nine well, and 12, that's right? Yeah, they are. They're nine and 12. And so what I do is I strew picture books, a term that kind of comes from unschooling where we have this really cute little coffee table in our living room. And just about every week I go online, I put a couple books on hold at the library and I just put them out on the coffee table and just leave them there. And then when my kids wake up in the morning and they're a little sleepy and groggy, you know, there's like a little place to curl up and, you know, they can be all kinds of things. They can be really short picture books. They can be those more involved ones, you know, like, uh, trying to think like uh, the Welcome to the Museum series, like Animalium, the Maps book, you know, those that have like a lot of detail, the way things work. That one, we actually just bought it because <laughs> my son, you know, just spent hours curled up with that one. So I also use them sometimes to introduce a subject. Like we've started talking a little bit about the election. And so we found a, a book, Grace for President, sweet picture book, but you know, when you're talking about language, you know, I don't know if it's beautiful language, but it's certainly like valuable language or, you know, campaign process, electoral votes, you know, they're hearing all those things and they're seeing it in a way that's a little more approachable than if I were to read something kind of dry from just a, I don't know, a textbook or something. Yeah. I mean, how, so, how likely would your kids be to pick up a textbook that you put on like civics or American government, you know, on the coffee table. Right, right, not going exactly, to, but they might exactly. teach through a picture book on, you know, I, we have Eileen Cristolo's yeah. vote picture book and some other picture books on the elections too, that I've got kind of swimming around the house right now too. So. Yeah. Cause they'll hear a word. They're like constituents. What's that mean? And then when they can see it in this book and it's, you know, really sweetly illustrated and it's about a little girl running for class president. So it's just a little bit more applicable to their lives. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I do too. So, okay. You told me that you ran across the book about the Mary Celeste or have you seen the book yet or you just ordered it? No, no, I just ordered it. It hasn't come in yet, but I had heard a podcast and, you know, sometimes that'll happen too, where like, I'll just hear something and I'm like, I really want to talk to my kids about this, but you know, the podcast or the book I'm reading or whatever is just a little bit beyond what I feel comfortable either reading aloud or handing to them to read on their own. And so, yeah, I, I heard about the Mary Celeste, which was a ghost ship in the late 1800s. And it just fascinated me. So I went online and I found it's called The Mary Celeste, An Unsolved Mystery from History. I mean, how can that not yeah. pull a kid right in, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's by Jane Yolen and she, oh, she writes such beautiful books. I know Jane Yolen. Is All just, Moon. Yeah. And yeah, she's just amazing. So I knew it was going to be good. So I was like, uh, put it in the Amazon cart, you know? <laughs> I love that Jane Yolen is so, like her writing is so diverse within picture books. She has the funny isn't she yeah. the one who wrote like the dinosaurs say goodnight or yes. Okay. Yeah. That and we love series. those. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. We got, love them. Yeah. Mm. And then like beautiful poetry. And then she writes a little bit about Greek mythology. Yeah. I think it's just like, there's such a widespread. We she had that Mary one? Celeste book on our shelf. I don't oh. think we've ever read it, but I know I picked it up at a book sale. One of those things where you look at it and go, I think I should probably own that. And usually when I find a favorite author, I just think, well, I need to own everything. So like, I'll just grab it from the <laughs> used bookstore, even if I don't know. You know, yeah. about the particular book. But now I need to go down and dig it out for my kids. <laughs> you you <laughs> mention it. I'm like, yeah, that does sound awesome. We had mentioned that picture books have reliable patterns of language, like Andrew Putawa suggests. But for me, it's the illustrations that really 
kind of put picture books in their own class. You definitely, you know, the words are almost poetry. You know, they're so carefully chosen and they're in just the right place. But it's the interplay for me between the words and the illustrations so that the illustrations become another language that you can participate in. It's not your ear that's hearing this language, it's your eye. But there are often, you know, hidden details or the pictures don't quite match up to what the text says. And so there's a sophisticated reading that's happening, even if before your kids know how to read, but that's something that's one of those places where it, I think picture books a lot of times are written with parents or older kids in mind because they're things that younger children wouldn't really necessarily pick up on, those sorts of ironies or discrepancies or you know just richness between the pictures and the words. And so those are really neat places where picture books, I think, have an advantage over, you know, merely text. What you get, I think, is you get multiple voices, especially if there's a different author and illustrator. Because when we had Jonathan Bean at the Author Access event, he kind of shocked everybody by saying that he doesn't have any, when he's, okay, he writes some picture books and illustrates them. But he's also just an illustrator for some books that are written by others. And when that happens, he said that he doesn't have any interchanges with the author of the book at all until it's completely done. For the most part, he gets the manuscript and he illustrates it. So he reads it and then he makes it his own through the illustrations. So he adds a different dimension to it through the illustrations without consulting with the author. And it made so much sense when he described why that is. It's not like he said, you know, it's not like I'm sitting there over the author's shoulder whispering to them like, don't do that. Make it say this, you know, <laughs> say it this way. So they both take this piece of work and then they add their own voice. It it makes it so much richer than I think it could be on its own in a lot of cases. And so I think you're right. Yeah. And then even when it's written and illustrated by the same person, there's a depth there that you, some things that only unfold through the illustrations that you wouldn't get if you were just reading the text and skipping the illustrations entirely. Yeah. And when I first started homeschooling, I remember hearing this word twaddle and I thought, oh, I don't know what that is exactly, but it was easy for me to figure out with picture books, the ones with the really beautiful illustrations, those were the ones that felt good to read to my kids and share with my kids and to give them that beauty, you know, through books. It was, you know, (laughs) when they would pull one off the shelf that was maybe a cartoon character from TV, you know, it was pretty clear to see that those illustrations didn't have that same power as Like you were talking about, you know, sometimes there's something hidden, like the Jan Brett books. I was just going to mention her. Yeah. You know, (laughs) and those little panels and oh my goodness. And we still pull those, like her winter ones, like the hat and the mitten and all those. We still pull those out every winter because there's still so much where you can just curl up and discover something new in those little panels. And then one of my kids, I remember figured out that some of the panels give you a preview of what's coming next. And that was like, that was huge because it was like, oh, I bet this is going to happen. I bet this is going to happen. And they just thought it was so neat. And that's such an important skill, like to figure out what's going to happen next, you know, stopping in a book. And you can do that, obviously, in chapter books, too. But asking what's coming next? What do you think is going to happen? What's this character going to do? And what are the consequences of what they're going to do? Yeah, I can't think of actually a better way to introduce the concept of foreshadowing than to pull out a Jam Brett book and like let them see it through illustrations before they try and do it with the text of a book. And that's so much fun. And then do you ladies remember Jonathan Bean mentioned in one of his books, there's like a picture of a bug or something in every single picture. Am I getting that? This is my home. This is my school. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's the mantis or something, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Katie did. Uh-huh. The Katie did. Okay, yeah. And I just, when he told me that, I had never noticed it before. But now, of course, every time we read it, it's like everyone's on the hunt for the Katie did, you know? <laughs> There's just fun things like that that you can't do with language that you can do with beautifully beautiful illustrations. Okay, so one of the other things I love about picture books is that it brings all, well, okay, so what happens a lot of time in my house, since my kids are 14, 12, 10, and then four and the twins are two, I've got this huge spread. So I'll sit down to read to the toddlers from a picture book. And then I'll look up and all my toddlers have run off to go, you know, pull all the toilet paper out of the bathroom and (laughs) shove things down the... (laughs) Yeah. Well, anyway, (laughs) you register. But I'll look up and all my big kids will be there. This happened recently with the book Press Here by Hervé Toulé. Have you ladies seen that book? Yes. <laughs> yes. I thought that was so much fun. Of course, there's like no story to this book, but it does not matter. It is so much fun. All of my big kids, it was like I was on the third page and my toddlers actually didn't run off that time. They were very engaged. 
But my big kids and my husband had all surrounded <laughs> and had to see what was going to happen when you shook the book to the left, you know. So it was so much fun. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's a fun book. But even with um, even with like a J.M. Brett book, I'll often find that my toddlers kind of wander around and they're listening and kind of checking back in. But my big kids are totally pulled in by it. So Courtney, do you notice that in your home between your toddler and your older kids? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think as they kind of cycle through books. So books that were we read with the nine-year-old, now the toddler is getting a chance at them. But the nine-year-old now, number one, can read the text. And so her, you know, memories of it on top of now she can read it. But so I find her often after we've read them, after the pile of books is just sitting on the couch, then sometime later in the day, she grabs one and she's curled up and investigating the pictures and, you know, kind of getting the inside jokes and things like that now. So that's really fun to see. Yeah. My 10 year old on his school checklist every day is read for 15 minutes to the toddlers. He always starts reading to the toddlers, but about 10 minutes into it, the toddlers are nowhere to be found. And he's still sitting there reading those things loud. So like, and looking at all the pictures and just like totally digging it. So right. Totally plus immersed those, in it. Yeah. Plus those picture books from there, when they, they remember from their younger years, they're like old companions or old friends. And so they have this kind of, oh, I don't know, connection to them. So yeah. And I, th- I think the connection then, you know, they can remember wistfully, you know, sitting on the couch and reading these books. And now they get to do it with the little ones. And so it really makes their relationship deep and loving as they, you know, get to see the little one, see what happens when you shake the book to the left. You know. Okay. So let's talk about Elizabeth Foss's storybook year. Cause I, we had Elizabeth Foss on for episode 36. Is that right? And she talked about reading aloud through Advent and Christmas, which was a favorite of our community. The podcast was a favorite of everybody. So inspiring. I remember getting off the phone call with her for that interview and being so jazzed up about reading aloud through the season. She also has this beautiful post called, Could It Be a Storybook Year? And we'll make sure we link to this in the show notes. It's a fabulous post on how she uses picture books as the basis for her entire curriculum, really, when homeschooling her kids. Do either of you want to pipe in on that a bit? It's a post that I should just have bookmarked in my regular bookmarks because I go back to it frequently. I love how she talks about picture books and what they've meant to her over the years. But then, you know, that she has like the premise that you could really build an entire curriculum through picture books. She has a website also called Serendipity that we can link to. And there it hasn't been updated recently, but it's a treasure trove of book recommendations and you know, she has a, in the sidebar, you can find a list of science baskets. And so on the topics of apples or bees or honey or electricity, there's a collection of 10 or 15 books on each topic that you can then go find at your library or at the bookstore and, you know, stack up, like Kara was saying, on the coffee table when you start the electricity segment of your science studies. It's just a wonderful, wonderful treasure of a post. I borrowed from that post for some co-op classes I was teaching. It just was like instant unit study, you know, for the kids. Exactly. And at the end, there's a long list of creative narration questions. And so, you know, it's sort of the, the next thing that you can do. You read the picture book and, you know, like you were saying, Sarah, maybe your toddlers kind of wander off and that's the end of it for them. But with big kids, what else can you do? Well, you can, you know, find the place on the map or you can, you know, get all of your stuffed animals dressed up as characters and play the story. You can write a letter to the author. You can, I don't know, her list is just absolutely extensive. And you can find the ones that are applicable, you know, interesting to your kids and applicable to the specific book. Okay, so this reminds me a lot of something we're doing here at the Real Out Revival, which is creating some whole family book club kits. I'm so excited about these. Our first one came out recently. We released these to members and The first one's on Boxes for Katya by Candace Fleming. Oh my goodness. I just love this picture book. And one of the things I love most about it is because when I read it, which Courtney sent it to me, she sent me a, a message and said, oh my goodness, if you have not read this book yet, you have to read it. Is that instantly when I read Boxes for Katya, I thought, oh my word, this is a perfect example of a picture book that can draw in everybody at their different ages. And then everybody gets... There's this Charlotte Mason quote, which I don't have at the tip of my tongue, but it's this beautiful quote about how education is like spreading a feast. 
And we don't even want to, but we can't spoon feed our children everything they need to know. And we don't want to do that because that's not true education. But as parents or teachers or just the primary caregivers of our children, we can spread this feast of ideas for our children through books and everybody can take what they're fit for. So you can read a picture book and your youngest children will take something different than your 14-year-old. But with a book like Boxes for Katya, everybody is going to take some, everyone is going to be moved. The story is, do either of you want to summarize it for our listeners? <laughs> Courtney does, right? Sure. <laughs> yes, I do, I do. No, um... <laughs> Boxes for Katja is about, it's a set of letters that went back and forth between a girl in America and a girl in Holland after World War II. So after World War II, there was scarcity and people in Holland didn't have, you know, they were living on the bare necessities. And people in America heard about this and got boxes together for just random Holland kids, (laughs) Holland kids, Dutch kids. And When Katja, the girl in Holland, received her box, she wrote a thank you letter back. And so what went from being sort of an anonymous, you know, good deed, a true relationship flowered between the two girls, the the girl in America and the girl in Holland. And it's a true story. It's based on a true story. It's Candace Fleming's mom, who was the little girl in America. So that piece of it just really, you know, knocks it out of the park for me. Yeah. And the sharing, she shares with everyone in her little town. And, you know, and then in America, they hear about this. So then they start sending more. And it's, oh, it's such a, I mean, beautiful tale of, you know, what can happen with just one small little gesture. And then it just built and built and built and it became this beautiful thing. So ladies, why don't you tell me about what you put inside there? What's inside the book club kit? Oh, we've got ideas for, I I mean, like just talking about it together, you know, dinnertime conversation starters. We've got food. Oh my goodness. There's so many neat ideas from that book because, you know, chocolate was so scarce and, you know, they send chocolate to Katya and she opens it up and it's like, they all describe just the taste of even a bite of chocolate and you know, as a total chocolate I'm like, I can't imagine going a day without chocolate. These people have gone for so long. So we have, you know, recipes with chocolate and cheese. And some of the things are like, if you're going to have a party, you know, and invite your friends over and, you know, your co-op families or whoever. And other things are just things that you could wake up that morning and do, which is kind of nice too, because we're all busy. Yeah. I like that idea. I, li- I love that fact that there are really super simple, th- small things that we could do. When things are time is really busy and you're crunched, but you still want to celebrate the book a bit together, you still want to take it one step further. And there's also things you can do when you're feeling like you have a little more energy or your whole family really falls in love with the book and you really want to make a big memory around it. Yeah. And I think a really neat thing about it is it's not a checklist, like one more thing to do. First, you do this and then you do this and you're not going to be complete until you do this. It's really something like you were saying, everyone can take where they are and what fits their family. And I think what you said is is really true, Sarah, that there are some books that really grab us and that really become sort of linchpin books for our families. And not every book is like that. But when we when we find those books, it's worth celebrating them and it's worth talking about them and it's worth revisiting them. Well, and sometimes in our families, we can feel like there's this pressure to read a book and create like a whole thing around it. And some books that works really well with like Boxes for Katya, that's a, it's just begging to have, you know, activities and discussion and everything. Or um, like I'm thinking the, um, how to make an apple pie and see the world. I love that Is book. That, it, I know. And it's so great. And it's just natural that you're just going to want to do more with it when you read it. And then sometimes there's those books that you read and you just want to just read them and love them. And, you know, I mean, you don't have to do much beyond that. Um, I remember when my nine-year-old was little and we found blueberries for Sal for the first time. And I was so excited. And if you Google blueberries for Sal, so many different activities come up. And I was just, it was, we loved the book and we love blueberries. And so I, you know, printed out some templates to make bears. You know, it was just like some brown circles of construction paper. And it was perfect for my, you know, two, almost three-year-old. And I was so excited and we loved this book. And she had no interest at all in gluing those circles down. And I was, was I going to like force her to like 
consignment <laughs> because we had had this wonderful experience with this book. Yeah. Or was I just going to glue the circles myself? Or, <laughs> or was I going to... That's gonna, what I would have done with my first. I'm just saying. <laughs> you can hang it up and put your name and your age. Uh-huh. So like Kara said, like I felt like there was something more I needed to be doing. Yeah. Because so like looking back, do you wish you could tell yourself just just love the story and don't take it a step further? Or do you think that was like, yeah, what's your thoughts looking back on that? I think, obviously, don't make the kid <laughs> glue down the circles <laughs> if they're not interested. And I think it's, it's perfectly fine because a lot of times they're really excited to glue down circles or to mm-hmm. draw a bear or to, and those things happen organically. But it's really great for the mama to have some things in her back pocket, some ideas to just say, hey, what about this? But to let it, to do it with a really light touch so that it's not an assignment, but it's something that can add richness and another layer of complexity to our experience. That's a perfect way to describe it. We used five in a row when, with my, my older kids when they were young, and I'm planning on using it again with my younger kids because I love it. But this time, I think I'll have a lighter touch when I use it. I think when I used it the first time, I felt like, okay, I have to read the book. I have to cover all these different areas. Yeah, I've got to cover the whole geography thing and I've got to do the art and I've got, well, really now I think I would love to use five in a row again. So for those of us who aren't, for those of you who are listening and aren't familiar, five in a row is a homeschool curriculum written by Stephen Jane Lambert based on picture books, some of the best picture books. And basically the premise is that you read the picture book every day for five days in a row. That's why it's called five in a row. And after that, you read it, the same picture book, After you read that book each day, there's a different activity that you do to extend it. And the activities are actually very lovely in the book. They're wonderful. My problem is I had used it like we have to check all these boxes. We have to do everything in the chapter. And so when I use it again with my younger ones, I'm going to take, I'm going to consider it more like a feast. Like Jane and Steve are spreading a feast before me and now we get to take whatever we're fit for. But I think their picture book selections in five in a row are fantastic. You better schedule time for your big kids to be involved too, because I bet they're going to migrate into the room where you guys are doing before five in a row and work on it too. I have a feeling that's true. (laughs) Carrie, did you use five in a row too? We did and we loved it. And we still have so many good memories around so many of those books. Like Cranberry Thanksgiving, we still make the cranberry bread every year at Thanksgiving. It's like a special thing. You know, if I were to try to take a year off, I think it would be like Thanksgiving's canceled, you know. Um, (laughs) I didn't realize that was a five in a row book, Kara, because we didn't officially do it, but you had mentioned it in the forums in membership. And so I immediately put it on hold. And of course, we had to make the cranberry bread too. And so, and it's a really good recipe, you know, as long as you leave out the raisins, in (laughs) my opinion. Um, (laughs) Always leave out the raisins. Wait, what the heck? You're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing is too, Sarah, like what you were saying is so true. When I first started that with my little guy, I felt like I only have five days. <laughs> I looked at it the wrong way. I looked at it as I only have five days to do all these activities and create all these things together with him and everything. And luckily, I don't know, something at some point shifted and I realized, no, we have five days to spend together just like loving this book and enjoying this book. And if all we do today is sit down and read and laugh at it, you know, the funny parts and, you know, point to the little ducklings and, you know, I mean, whatever, that's okay. So yeah, I definitely wish I could go back yeah, <laughs> and tell myself, I, think- I love what you said, Courtney, light touch. Light touch. Light I know touch. I do too. Yeah. yeah. I think the internet is funny because it's such, there's so many ideas. So you could you know, Google five in a row, the story about ping, and you will come up with like a million different blogs with ideas for how to extend the story about ping, which is awesome if that's the way, if that's how it like, you know, fires you up and your kids are totally into it. But I think it's also okay just to read the story about ping for five days in a row, because really that's how your children, that's how the books become companions for your children is just by sharing them leisurely with them. Not like we got to get done with the book because we have that map activity. We have this other thing to do. And I don't think that's the spirit that Five in a Row was written in at all was the, this sort of taskmaster list. I definitely, I, I don't know. I've never talked to Jane or Steve. We should probably have them on the podcast. Yes, you <laughs> should. Get to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get on that, Kara, would you? I will. Yeah, you know, really good books, I think, are enough when your kids are teeny tiny. I, you know, again, time machine. You know, I, I know. wish I had that time machine to go back and just whisper in my ear really good books. And the books for five in a row are so carefully chosen. 
their beautiful language, their beautiful illustration. There's classics, there's more modern ones, but you can tell that so much a consideration. You know, intention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's so much careful intention that went into choosing each one of those books that I think they're kind of enough. And then the other stuff is just the fun extras, yeah. you know? Especially for moms said. who want to, sorry, Courtney, as I no. say, especially for those moms who want to, I remember with my first ones, just really wanting to do something. I wanted to do something schoolish. So the activities in five in a row are really a great way to kind of satisfy that mama drive to be like, no, we're, we're really homeschooling now <laughs> in a gentle and really pleasurable. Yes. Way. Yeah. That's a big thing early on. You want it to feel real and you want your kids to feel like it's real. So you feel like you want to start having activities and things and but reading is real, you know? Yeah. I mean, sharing those books together, we still have picture books that are just... I'll find my son who's 12 curled up with our Curious George treasury because Curious George was one of his like best pals when he was little reading those books. And you know what you said, Courtney, about like organically things will happen if you give like time and space around the book. He wrote sequels to all the Curious George books because (laughs) he loved them and they were a part of his world. So it just naturally happened. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to pull out paper. I didn't have to, you know, set him up and say, today we're going to do a sequel to Curious George. And, you know, I'm completely biased, but I I think they're, (laughs) I think they were very good books for a four and five and six year old. Yeah. I mean, Sarah said that the books became companions for her Mm -hmm. children. And I think that's what we want. That's the deep family culture that we're striving to build is building relationships with books. And one way that that's happened for us is finding picture books of chapter books that we're reading. So even though, you know, my kids are older and they can sit through longer sections of reading and we can sustain a story over time, picture books of the same stories often, again, just lend a richness and another way to approach the same story, another way to visit this companion, this old friend. We really like the picture book of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that's illustrated by Tudor Humphreys. And so those illustrations sort of you know, not in any, it doesn't close anything down and sort of make it like, this is what the white witch looks like. But it's like, oh, could the white witch look like this? And it helps us to revisit the story that we're reading in the longer chapter books. And we really love the My First Little House books too, that tell the stories of Laura Ingalls Wilder's books. Those books, again, a lot of them are illustrated by Renee Graff, but she based her illustrations on the Garth Williams illustrations. So they're just very familiar but they're different. And so it's another another lens through which to experience the same story. And now this time through, we were just reading Farmer Boy with the older two. And the toddler had all of the Farmer Boy, My First Little House books. And so he's got Almanzo on the brain too. And he's got his cows out and he's teaching them how to be big grown-up oxen. I love that because I think sometimes we worry that books that are created for younger children based on a picture book, for example, like the Little House picture books that are based on the real Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder, they don't close, like you said, they don't close our children off to them. They actually open it up. They actually open up that whole world of the Ingalls family to our youngest kids and actually give it another dimension for our older kids rather than dumbing it down or taking it down a notch. That's not actually what uh, really well done picture books do at all. And they're not, you know, created equal. It's you're not always going to find the perfect match. But in those two cases for our family, it's been a really fun way to widen our experience. So let's talk about our favorites. What are some of your favorite picture books that you've... (laughs) Do we have another hour or... (laughs) I saw the look on both of your faces when I said that. Like, oh. (laughs) Okay, so we already talked about Owl Moon, but Jane Yolen is an absolute favorite around here. She is just a masterful picture book writer. We should try and get her on too. That might be a really big project. (laughs) I see Kara making notes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I am guilty. I am. But, you know, her books are favorites around here, as well as Jan Brett, which we've already mentioned her as well. And she comes out with a new book every year. And boy, I'm telling you, that lady does not slow down and she her books do not suffer for it either. They are, she is a master. And every single time she comes out with another book, I am dumbfounded at how 
beautiful and rich they are year after year after year. We just got Jam Brett's Beauty and the Beast. And Kara was saying, often there's foreshadowing in the, in the side panels. And in Beauty and the Beast, it's actually, I don't know what the opposite of foreshadowing is. It's showing what there are, let's see, what are they called? Tapestries hanging in the Beast's castle. And it shows what the people look like before the enchantment. So now they're all turned oh, into yeah. animals, but you can see that the footman used to be this dapper little man instead of a little monkey. <laughs> so it's really, it's a, a neat twist on the Jambrette foreshadowing. I was Googling it to see if I could come up with the word yeah. that's the opposite of <laughs> foreshadowing, but it's not coming up quick enough. I was going to sound so smart. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody, one of you mentioned the Maple Hill Farm books. Yes. Oh, I love those. We still, and you know, again, it's those, those books that you build memories around. We can still say to each other, you know, and his father was potato who disappeared and like all of us will start rolling and laughing and, you know, we still read them and, you know, they're pretty good sized books. They have a lot of illustrations, you know, a lot of words and stuff, but they're just comforting and they just feel like a big bowl of macaroni and cheese, but (laughs) (laughs) that's good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, then, you know, though, when your kids stumble across that book in their adulthood, it's going to instantly take them back to their happiest childhood memories. Yeah. yeah. That's one of them I can't throw away. Not that I no, I don't throw books away. That's not what I meant. But, you know, um, <laughs> when you give books away or when you, you know, part with them, it's like I, that's one that I just have to hold on to because I want to have my grandkids in my lap someday reading that book and saying, I used to read this to your mom. Or I used to read this to your dad. <laughs> I love that. I get very sentimental about picture books. It's you know. it's hard not to, I think, as mothers too, because they bring us back to when our children were, when we first started reading them or maybe yeah. to our own childhood if there's favorites there too, you know. I love the books by Barbara Cooney. So Miss Rumpheus is... Yes, Oh yes. my goodness. I could read that a million times. And also Roxa Boxen, which Barbara Cooney illustrated, which was written by Alice McLaren. That's another one that I just love. What about the Emily Dickinson Barbara Cooney. Do you guys know that one? It might just be called Emily. I didn't look it up. But... Oh, yes. I have seen that one. I do like that one a lot. We don't own it, but we should because I have an Emily yeah. Dickinson nut in my 14 year old. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> That's right. Well, and Sarah, you had mentioned what book was it that your family was reading that everyone was laughing, you know, and they were so into it. The, the press here? Press here. Yes. yes. Funny picture books. Yes. You know, I mean, those are big for us too. The Day the Crayons Quit. It's hilarious. I seen, I've you know I've seen and, it, but I actually haven't read it. Yeah, I think sometimes the librarians look at me a little funny because I go in to pick up this stack of picture books, and I have a child that's almost as tall as me, <laughs> you know, and my daughter with me, and they're, they're like, "What are you? Who do you have another child that you yeah. never bring to the library?" <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, books like that, and um, Mac Barnett's books, like Extra Yarn, and is it Sam and Dave. Yeah, Sam and Dave dig a hole. <laughs> I don't <laughs> you know, think I've seen those. Like okay. Yeah, and then um, there's the the other one that just, it, I think it came out last year. It's the book with no pictures. Oh, I'll keep hearing about Murlock. this one. Okay. Yes. So good. No pictures. So does it count? Is it okay? To talk about <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know. Did you I just break the picture. rule? <laughs> you just broke the rule. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, have you guys, have you mentioned Yummy Yucky? Oh my goodness. Is that a- those are Leslie. so funny. <laughs> no, okay. Every time I say that those are so funny, somebody tells me they're not really funny. They're kind of rude. <laughs> well, I think they're yeah. so funny. Like my gut is going to pop every time I read them. And I read them all the time. But like, no, no, yes, yes. Or the yummy, yucky, booger, burger. Oh my gosh. I think those <laughs> books are so funny. <laughs> I don't know if I should admit this, but the one that's in high rotation at my house is the toot book. <laughs> I don't have that one, but I saw it the other day on Amazon. Yes, it's great, actually. <laughs> It is really really funny. (laughs) My son put it on hold at the library under my account as a joke. (laughs) (laughs) And we read it anyway because it's funny. Yes. I Leslie tried to bring that up at his wedding. No, not really. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I heard the the toddler walking around saying, P (laughs) you. Is how my husband reads the book. So oh, he's getting funny. that rich language. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another book that we just read that we thought was so funny. What was it? 
Oh, I think Andy Wilson's Hello Ninja is really funny. Have you do you have either of you read that one? Yeah. No, huh? yeah. I don't know that one. Okay, it's a board book, and my toddlers could recite the whole thing for you pretty much. But I just think it's hilarious. The base the pictures that really make it funny because the expression on the little ninja's face are, you know, it's totally this picture book about a ninja who's really just a little, you know, it's, it's a child who's dressed up like a ninja and ninjas chop, ninjas like to belly flop. And then you've got like ninjas prance, ninjas dance, ninjas train the king of France. And you've got the ninja, the little boy ninja, like trying to train his cat to be the king of France. It's just funny. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta pick it up and read it. It's a good one. We need to do a whole thing about board books because we do. Oh, there's so many. There's so many that I still love. And that's mm-hmm. really silly because my kids are supposed to be way beyond board books, you know, but I asked them both when we were getting ready for this, you know, what are the books that I should talk about? And they said the Sandra Poynton books, you know? Oh my goodness. Of course. They're like yeah. the epitome of funny. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They're so good. And I can still recite them. And I'm thinking like, I should have other things in that brain space by now, but, <laughs> but I don't. It's taken. It's taken. Yeah. <laughs> And technically the Carl books, did did you guys read those? Yes. With your kids? Okay. Yeah. I mean, those are word lists. They're picture books, but also board books. But those were huge favorites because we just talked about them. And, you know, and it was, it was really nice because as, well, two reasons. One, sometimes you just feel like you can't read another book. Maybe it's just me, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of like, oh, I can't read one more book. Yes, and but, So you don't. So you grab one of those off the shelf and you talk about them together. And then I just realized that set us up for learning how to talk with each other about books, which there's been a huge payoff later in homeschooling, you know, that started with them being babies, reading those little Carl books. I love that. One of my favorite wordless books is Goodnight Gorilla. And I love mm-hmm. that you can just, you can pull your toddler or your preschooler onto your lap. And if you're tired, you can just sit there and drink your coffee and say, you read this one to me. And oh boy, yeah. can they? Because the pictures in that book just lend for a great story, no matter who's telling it. And the author mm-hmm. is not telling it except through her pictures, which is really unique and wonderful. The book Hug is like that too. Is that Kevin Henke's? No, it's Jez Arborough. I think it's got three words in the oh, whole book. And, okay. But it's just so sweet. But it's lots of animals. So it's so easy to sit down with a toddler and have them, you know, again, those times when you just kind of want to drink your coffee, you know, <laughs> and have them say, what's the lion say? You know, what's yes. the elephant doing? And yeah, kids love that book because it's just packed with animals. And at the end. Well, I, I won't give away the ending. Everybody should go read it. It's really good. Okay. <laughs> I Yay, will go we get will. it. <laughs> okay. Other favorites. Well, I've got to mention All the World's a Stage. And I don't even know. It's a book about Shakespeare. And this is one of those times when you can draw in your big kids when you're doing Shakespeare studies. Picture books are a great way to get plot summary, characters down, main conflicts. You can do all of that so easily with picture books. And then when you approach the real text with your big kids, they've already got this deep, rich foundation of knowledge. So the book is called All the World's a Stage. I don't know who the author is because we don't read the book. It has kind of silly rhyming text, but it's illustrated by Anita Lobel. Yeah, I found it. Okay, then it's by Rebecca Pyatt Davidson. So Anita Lobel is Arnold Lobel's wife, oh. Arnold Lobel of Frog and, Frog and Toad, and she's also an illustrator. And this book is so fabulous. Every page is a different Shakespeare play. And so she has an entire page, and it really gives you almost all the characters and the major plot points in one page. And so it's a great way to get a handle on a play and what's happening and who the characters are and how they relate to each other and who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. I just love it. I'm buying it right now. Keep talking. (laughs) (laughs) I literally just hit place your order. (laughs) That's how me and Kara do it when we're doing show notes. (laughs) Yes, it's terrible. We have our Amazon (laughs) wonderful. So I keep hearing people write in, you know, and they say, I have to stop listening to my pot to your podcast or my husband is never going to, you know, (laughs) my Amazon card is exploding. Yeah. Okay. Guilty well, as charged. you know, when we air this podcast, we'll be just, I think it will be just after Ken Ludwig has taught his How to Introduce Your Kids to Shakespeare workshop. And we have a list of uh, best, well, 
this is the funny part about podcasting because we're recording this so far in advance. We're making right now a list of the best books to introduce your kids to Shakespeare, you know, retellings and picture books. So we'll make sure all the world's a stage on that list. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. (laughs) So perfect. You know what other book we love is, well, I really like picture books that rhyme. And I know that some people kind of get that kind of grades on them. I love reading rhyming picture books. So I love Nancy Shaw's Sheep in a Jeep books. I think they're so funny. And I also love Nancy White Carlstrom's Jesse Bear books. Like, Jesse Bear, What Will You Wear? And she's the same one who wrote Jamberry, which people might be more familiar with. We like her stuff too. Wait, no, she's not the one who did Jamberry, is she? Bruce Deegan. Why am I so confused? Hang on a second. I know why. Because Bruce Deegan illustrated Jesse Bear. Is the illustrator? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm like, wait a second. I always thought that was the same person. Okay, same illustrator. That makes sense. When you said Jamberry, it reminded me of Each Peach Pear Plum. Oh, Mm Yeah. Oh, I love that little book. Yeah. My, I, we have this really good family friend who through her career, she was the first, second and third grade teacher and she retired and she gave us all of her picture books. And that was one of them that was in there. And I mean, there was so much gold in there. It was like somebody dropped off just a bag of happiness. On the <laughs> I think seriously, that week was like, we're going to read Jan books. That's what we did <laughs> the entire week for homeschooling. And we just had a blast. It was so good. So that's fun. I love it when I stumble across a either a used bookstore or a garage sale where the person who's running it had like really good taste in books. And I'm always like, oh my gosh, I'll be right back. I have to go to the bank and get more cash. <laughs> I'm going to buy your entire table full of stuff right here. So you can tell within like a second. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of good, good stuff right here. <laughs> I'm glad that happens to other people. My heart starts racing. And I'm like, oh. I have to get in there. Yeah. We went to one where two teachers were retiring and I felt like, okay, I'm just going to buy all my curriculum now. (laughs) That's a good way to think about it because then your budget gets a little bit wider than just the normal library sale. Yeah. Okay. And then the other favorites in our house are the Paul Galdon fairy tales. Are you both familiar with those? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are my favorite. We've been slowly... Well, we had a few of them, but I've been trying to collect the whole set for Clara, my four year old who loves them. So every time there's a holiday or birthday, she gets another one and it's getting to be quite the collection. And I love them. I love the illustrations. I love the way the stories are told. So yeah, I think they're a perfect first introduction to those fairy tale stories. Yeah, me too. And then of course, Seven Silly Eaters is a total favorite around here by Marianne Hoberman. I think that book is so hilarious. The illustrations, the text, and of course I have a gazillion children. So I think this book is like impossibly funny. And there's twins. It's just so funny. My whole, all my kids, they just, everybody, it's one of those books where everybody crowds around and the illustrations by Marla Frazee are hysterically funny. And talk about a book where the illustrations lend a whole nother hilarious dimension to the book. That's a really good example of one of those really well done picture books. I hadn't mentioned Kevin Henke's, but he wrote Owen and Chrysanthemum and all those little books. Those are really sweet too. My kids like those a lot. Of course I have an Owen, so... That's how I discovered him. But <laughs> have either of you seen then, his newer um, book, Waiting? I think it's called Waiting. Oh, no, no, I've heard about it, but I haven't. I haven't yeah. read it. I haven't either, but I keep hearing about it, so I need to get my hands on it. And my my daughter went through a whole phase last year of the if you give a mouse a cookie, a pick a pancake, all of those. Yes. We have this really cool program at our library where you can read to a therapy dog, and every week she brought one of those books. Oh, to read that's to awesome. Dog. Because she, you know, they liked them. I love that program. We don't have it in our local library, I don't think. But the library I used to work yeah. at years ago, we had it. And you it used to work at a library? I did. Oh, oh I didn't know this. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> My I husband, when I got that job, was like, do you think, you know, you don't really think of like an extroverted, really talkative person working in the library. <laughs> he's like, don't you think that could be a problem? <laughs> <laughs> It was on occasion, but for the most part, it was just great. (laughs) Yeah, it was wonderful. I worked at a library for, I guess, almost three years. Awesome. I mean, talk about great conversationalists. Library, working with librarians is so much fun because you always know you're going to get to go to work and talk about books. It's just awesome. It's kind of like here. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you, ladies, for carving out some of your Saturday to come chat with me. I knew this would be fun to talk about picture books. I hope that our listeners are inspired to pick up a picture book with their kids today, no matter what their age. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thanks. It has been a lot of fun. Okay, so for our listeners, if you want, first of all, you can always get our show notes. You can get the links and books that we talked about today by going to readaloudrevival.com and clicking on episode 45. 
perfect. <laughs> you read my mind. You must have seen the deer in headlights look on my face. <laughs> I, I don't know what episode this is. <laughs> episode 45. Perfect. Also, we have created a brand new read aloud book list, and it has all of our favorite picture books as well as favorite books in other categories. Categories like our best classic literature, best fantasy, best board books, best middle grade novels, books for kids in large families, best audiobooks. And these are books that have been specifically chosen for their read aloud ability, which I'm deciding is an official word. <laughs> that is books that are written with a specific penchant for being read aloud, that they are that beautiful, highly sophisticated language, or at least the kind of fun memory making kind of books that you want to be reading aloud with your kids. So you can get access to that book list for free. Head to rarbooklist.com. That's R-A-R, like Read Aloud Revival, booklist.com. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. My name is Diego. And I am 10 years old, and I am from the state of Minnesota. My favorite book is Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats and Them. I like it because it's very exciting. My name is Jamie. I'm five years old, and, and I like five little monkeys jumping on the bed because I like it that the monkeys are jumping on the bed and all of them get hurt. And then the mama jumps on the bed. Monkey's jumping on the bed. Yeah. Guess, guess, mama jumping on the guess, bed. Yeah, and were the little monkeys jumping on the bed too? Mm-hmm. Is that funny? Yeah. And what's your name? Elia. Elia. And where, where are you from? Minnesota. Yeah, and how old are you? Four. You're four? No. You're two. Two. You're two. My name is Shrewd, and I'm eight years old. I'm from Minnesota. My favorite book is Rascal because it has a pet coon that's very special. But what is strange that my dad catches and kills coons. My name is Laura, and I'm nine years old, and I live in New York. My favorite read-aloud book is The Mysterious Bendix Society, and I like it because there's a lot of mystery. Each chapter is a cliffhanger, and there's a lot of adventure, and that's why I like The Mysterious Bendix Society. What's your name? Tanner. And Tanner, where do you live? Kenya, Idaho. Good. And what's your favorite story? The Book of Small Pictures. Why do you like that story? Because it's funny. What makes it funny? Because of the funny words. All the funny words in it? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ashlyn, and I live in Kamei, Idaho. I am 10 years old, and my favorite book is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What I like about it is that it takes a while for Charlie to find a ticket to go to the chocolate factory and that there's a lot of adventure and there's a sequel. My name is Evelyn and I live in Colorado and my favorite book is Chronicles of Narnia and I like the part where the beavers invite the kids to their dance. And it's really funny because the wolves come in. Thank you so much, kids. I always love hearing the books that you suggest. And I even heard a couple of you suggest books we talked about during the show today, which is fun. Remember, you can get the links to books we've mentioned in the podcast, articles, the whole nine yards from this episode. Go to readaloudrevival.com. Look for episode 45. And that's super quick access to all the books we mentioned. Also, if you need a really good book list, the Read Aloud Revival has a brand new free book list, and we mentioned it during the show. You can get yours at rarbooklist.com. All right, that's it, folks. Until next time, go build your family culture around books. <laughs>